Once again people, Elevai True TV here again and this time with my second interview. If you thought the first interview was powerful, now check out this one. This is Coyle Grant from the Campaign for Truth and Justice. Let's go in. Is thank you for coming and um, I'd like to just mention why I asked you to do the, um, the interview and why, how I came into contact with you. Um, and maybe I'll mention that throughout the interview, but also I just wanted to say to the people that might be watching that it was only a few weeks ago that you was able to, you and other people were able to prevent me from going into prison on remand, because I believe without people calling like yourself, um, I would have been locked up. So thank you for that. Now, the first time... Well, thank you for... No, carry on, it's okay. The I'm first gonna time... say, well, thank you for um, inviting... Sorry, my brother, carry on, you okay. carry on. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that the first time I came in contact with you was I got a link through and um, I followed the link. Something urged me to follow the link because the link didn't actually say anything about you. It was actually a picture of someone else who is now a friend who I speak to. And, and when I looked at it, I was shocked at what I was seeing because I knew that I'd been fighting um, for justice via the family courts. And that's the way I came into, the, do, uh, into seeing a lot of injustice. But when I saw a couple of things that you'd done, in particular, you was actually showing faces of judges one and you because i didn't know much at the time mm -hmm. i've spoken to and i found this to be very powerful so the first question i like to ask is how is it possible that you have no fear in actually showing these people okay and it's a question i very much welcome and enjoy um to to answer um but first of all let me just express my gratitude for you getting in touch and so on and seeing where we've where we've come from and where we're potentially going and having the courage and faith to to get in touch and see what what can be achieved now um in relation to those judges facing every single one of those judges i have had previous dealings with and i hold documented evidence on each and every one of them having broken the law. And, and so by doing that, by putting out a banner with all of these judges and saying what they have done and saying no lawbreaker can be a law enforcer, effectively, if I didn't have that truth, if I didn't have the evidence to support what I say they've done, I could have been held in contempt of court and that would carry, could carry an automatic two-year prison sentence. But they know that my fight has been to get into court. And, and in order for them to challenge me on the evidence that I have against them, they would have to get me into court. And their desire is obviously to keep me out of court at whatever cost. Wow, very powerful. So that's where basically it's put... Mm -hmm. Sorry. Very powerful. And um, it gives people indication of, of your knowledge and where you are now but can I also <clears throat> and I'll go more into the stuff that you just said about the fact that you know um, you have evidence on them and their wrongdoing and their corruption but can I also go back now and just ask what was your why did you start the fight for justice because I know you're involved with different things as well it's not just um, the corruption that's going on, you're involved in different causes. So what was the initial spark that brought you into fighting for justice? Well, the, the initial, and again, thank you for asking, the initial spark that um, set this off, this, this, this um, two and a half, almost decade of fighting, is, um, stems from the background involved and leading up to the death of one of my children a 15 month old baby who the authorities left to suffer and die from dehydration whilst in a, a state hospital. And also the circumstances leading up to his death. And at some point um, I retained the services 
of lawyers to pursue a case of medical negligence. And then those lawyers, despite having the, the means to, to, to pursue such a, a case, deliberately chose to give me false advice about the law. And ultimately, that led to me bringing an action against those lawyers and the hospital myself. And because they had no defense against the case that I was pursuing, they could only rely on the influence of their friends within the legal establishment. And thereafter, in an effort to stop me pursuing justice, in an effort to stop a grieving father having answers to involve in the death of their child, the authorities, no, well, initially started with this judge who presided over a matter being prosecuted by his brother. And that judge conducted, the, or his brother's law firm, I must always be clear about that. Um, so it was either his brother or his brother's law firm. And that judge conducted those proceedings in my absence without me having any legal representation. And at the end of it, that judge issued a warrant for me to be picked up, kidnapped from the street and brought straight to prison without charge, without trial, without ever passing through a court of law. And I spent 10 weeks of my life in prison, wrongfully imprisoned, falsely imprisoned, uh, and uh, until one day a prison officer, I was having a conversation with him when we were let out for an association for a bit of fresh air, and he, it turned out he was an Arsenal supporter, and I had gone to school with a couple of previous Arsenal supporters, so that caused a conversation. And during the conversation, he asked me, so how did you come to be in prison? And when I told him, he said, oh, you shouldn't be here. So he presented me to these senior officers. They made arrangements to produce me in the high court in the Strand. And when they brought me before a Mr. Justice Buckley, and when he heard how I came to be in prison, I could hear the disappointment in his voice at what one of his colleagues had done. And uh, Mr. Justice Buckley turned and said to me, Mr. Grant, the background of your case is extremely tragic, and there are many ways in which you can pursue it. Go home to your family. And he let me out on May the 28th, 1999. When I stepped out onto the steps of the High Court, I wondered to myself how many people previously, before me, had been subjected to that. In, in fact, that wasn't an unlawful, that was a criminal act because it was uh, kidnapping and false imprisonment. And I, on that day, I determined that on the behalf of those people, including myself, I was going to fight. And, and, and I, as I said, that was May the 28th, 1999. And the fight has been ongoing ever since. And they, I have been relentless, and they have been relentless to, to, to stop me. And some of my actions, in order to get into court, has led to um, various acts of civil, civil um, disobedience. Um, wow. You know, to deliberately try and get in the system. To get yeah. in the system. <clears throat> well, that's very, very powerful. And it's a great testament to your strength of character to be um, fighting while um, grieving the loss of one of your children. And um, I really send out deep condolences to you on that count because I don't know what it's like to lose a, a child permanently. You know that I've lost my children in the family court, but <clears throat> hopefully one day I'll see them again. So I understand that this must be a real, real pain for you. And um, it's, it's amazing to hear you say that you have been relentless but the story that you tell about the judge in this case who seems to have some kind of compassion, this kind of shocks me because I've, I've become in the mind state that they're all, they're all corrupt. So you believe that this man was actually uh, abiding by the law and, and adhering to justice then in, that, in, in this case? Uh, do you know what, do you know what uh, my brother? I, 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 can, I have to confess with the truth, and um, I've come across at least two or three re, um, respectable judges with integrity, because there was a time 
before another judge, District Judge Litchfield, when um, the, they were trying to, the other side was trying to have my case struck out of court. And they claimed that I was suing, the, the lawyers representing the lawyers I was suing, claimed that I was suing their clients for causing me to miss the opportunity to sue the hospital. And I said, no, no, no. I'm suing your client for a breach of contract that they were retained to pursue a cause on my behalf, to, 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 to act in my best interest, not to um, miss, uh, give me miss, uh, false advice about the law and so on. And when that judge saw that in my statement, he, he, he said then, I am issuing an order that you do not misinterpret any part of Mr. Grant's claim. And in front of them, before we left that room, he said to me, Mr. Grant, hurry up and issue your case against the, the, the hospital because you have a very good case indeed. Yeah. And so and and the third, the third judge, in fact, who was the first one, because the absolute first time, my first time of imprisonment in this country at the age of 36, I think I was, I was on bail for an act of civil disobedience where I had spray painted those lawyers' windows because they were trying to have my case pushed out of court and I was trying to push it back in by whatever means necessary. And uh, so I was on bail for criminal damage, but no conditions attached to my bail. However, police officers from the Metropolitan Police Force came and arrested me on an allegation of breach of bail conditions. And that meant they were going to keep me in custody overnight, produce me in court the following day. The following morning, when, when they produced me in court and said breach of bail, I stood up to say there was no condition. The judge told me to shut up and sit down that my advocate will speak on my behalf. And that, from that day, I learned my lesson because that advocate said nothing at all. And then that judge remanded me to four days in Brixton prison. I was absolutely petrified. I literally thought they had sent me there so that I could be killed. Yeah. Nonetheless, four days later, I was produced in the same court, different judge. And that judge, Mr. Johnson, the first thing he said, why is Mr. Grant in custody? The prosecutor proudly said, breach of bail conditions. And the judge replied, but there are no conditions attached to his bail for him to be in breach of. Why is he in custody? And this, the prosecutor went silent. And there, thereafter, the judge said, I made it clear a very long time ago, I do not wish to become embroiled in any form of corruption. And he released me from that. And that was my first ever period. And as I said, the second time. So those are three judges, Judge, District Judge Johnson, District Judge Litchfield, and Mr. Justice Buckley. I don't think they're, they're presiding anymore because this was over 20 years ago. Okay. But they... When you say the judge said he didn't want to be involved in any corruption, my instant question would be that obviously there's powers at, at work that can just take you and put you in prison and the police will adhere to those orders. How is it for judges like this who you say have some form of integrity to operate in that system when people seem to be operating with immunity in a corrupt way? How is that? Well, you know what, this is, this is why, as I said, I've started fighting because who knows how many they have co-opted with before in terms of doing their criminality. Yeah. Um, but, but, and unless we stand up, and this is why I support you for, 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 for having the gall and the courage and the tenacity to stand up and not just roll over and bend over and allow them to screw you. Um, uh, so, so, and that is what I've been doing ever since, because as I said, we are, are born and raised in this country and to believe in this system of justice. And when I'm wronged, you want to use the system that's supposed to deliver justice to, 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 to persecute me. Good. So I, I just basically refuse to have it. And I, as I said, I can only speak of my experience. 
and the experience I have, I have had in going before the, those judges at that time in the very early stage. Do you know there was a there was a time one of my colleagues wrote to uh, uh, well he he wrote a letter to the Attorney General and he copied several people and one of them was Stanley Bess. He was the chairman of the British Legal Association and he responded and he responded in a way of um, disbelief at what we had um, at what we had um, brought to his attention how because and he and he said that you know the integrity of the judiciary today has been painfully achieved um, you know and and so on and he made various references but then he went on to say um, he'll keep an open mind about what we presented to him because if only a scintilla I think I'm pronouncing that right. If only a scintilla of what we say is correct, then it's a matter for very serious concern indeed. And so, you know, my general belief in the system prior to becoming involved, and, you know, especially on the family side as well, um, was that it worked. And, and especially as well, at, at one point I went on jury, I was on jury service and so on and so forth. And, and I saw, you know, that direct experience of the jury service, um, the trial by jury working. Yeah. And, and what, you know, um, but clearly what, what had happened, we had got to a point where they dis decided collectively that no matter what they do, they're, they're going to have to stand together. And, and I think that was the fact of, if they were to do the right thing, then it could cause the collapse of the whole the whole system. Whole system and, yeah. yeah, and the consequence of that was was far more severe than them. You know, I think they just hoped that maybe at some point that I they would get um, I would stop and roll over and accept that I there's no possible chance of winning and so on. I mean, we haven't mentioned it as yet, because we haven't gotten to it. But at one point they held me in prison for six years because they weren't sure how to handle this whole situation. But I'm sure we'll get to that bit once you, um, once you raised your relevant question. So. Well, what I wanted to ask as well is because you mentioned that the first, um, you mentioned why you started fighting for justice and that you decided to hold the lawyers who were supposed to be looking for some kind of justice for your child and what had happened and the, 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 the health authority itself, you decided to take them to court, but then you was put in prison. So what happened to that initial case? Did you try to carry on with that case or? Good question. So the, so the case in relation to my, the negligence of my son, that was settled out of court. But in, a, in addition to my son's death, brother, what happened on the day was one hour before my son died, I had gone to the hospital looking for my family, but I was repeatedly told, Mr. Grant, your son's not here, he's well, he only had a tummy upset, he's, and he's not been admitted. And they even said to me, I can check the children's section to confirm. I did that, they, were, they said that he hadn't been admitted. I then used a telephone in the corridor, this was 1994, so we didn't have mobile phones. I used the hospital um, phone to call home to see if I had passed my wife on the way. I got no reply. I went back to the main reception and once again they repeated that he's not there. So I left the hospital reassured now that my son isn't there uh, but wondering where he, he, my wife had gone with him. So when I got home, they still weren't there, but I received a phone call from my brother-in-law saying that his, his sister is at hospital crying, the baby is not well. And I was nearly arguing with my brother-in-law saying, no, 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 they're not there. I've just come back. So I've agreed to ring the hospital. As I put my phone down, the phone rang again. This time it was my wife screaming down the phone, get the hell out of the flat, the baby is not well. In my wife's obvious distress, not obvious to me at the time, but obvious now, I slammed the phone down on her, thinking that this was some cruel joke being played by her brother and herself. Nonetheless, I immediately picked the phone up again 
and half an hour before my son died, I was still being told, no, Mr. Grant, your son's not here. I begged the receptionist to double check. She checked the first ward. He wasn't there. She checked the second ward. She didn't say another word to me, and I don't blame her for anything at all. She put me straight through to the ward, and the next thing I heard was, oh, Mr. Grant, come quickly. Your son's here. He's not well. I rushed back to the hospital to go and find my son had just died. I, I collapsed to the ground it was my five-year-old daughter who came to me and said, oh, don't cry, Daddy. At least he's gone to heaven. Yeah? And, and five months after the death of my son, my, I'd been married 10 years at the time, five-year-old daughter, my, uh, um, and my wife was pregnant with our third child. Five months after, my 10-year my marriage broke up because um, my wife kept blaming me, saying, if you were there, you would have made the doctors do something. It's your fault that he died because you weren't there. That's why. And so we became separated. After a year of being separated, now I'm trying to grieve for my son, but it feels like I'm grieving for my whole family. That's when I went back to our lawyers and I said, I want you to sue the hospital for giving me false information about the welfare and whereabouts of my child, which this false information has led to the breakup of my marriage because my wife, uh, you know, led to my wife blaming me, which has led to the breakup of my marriage. And those lawyers, despite having the, the, the means from legal aid to pursue that case, they told me in writing, there is no law in this country that allows anyone to sue for false advice. And that is what I, it, it, this wasn't about money. I simply wanted to, to prove to my wife that I came and they sent me away. That's why I wasn't there. Yeah. And, 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 and these lawyers were standing in my way. And despite my, the involvement, my MP at the time, she's passed away now, may she rest in peace, Tessa Jowell, right into the legal aid board asking them to transfer my certificate. Other lawyers giving me case references to bring to this, those lawyers, my, you know, the lawyers who told me there's no law. <clears throat> Despite all of that, they initially refused to budge until eventually they, they, they allowed the transfer of my certificate. When the new firm who put it in writing that I did have a case, when I, I by now I suffered a nervous breakdown lost my job and so on and so i said to the new law lawyers i want to bring an action i want you to include the lawyers in the action against the hospital and without doing anything at all without budging from from yes you have a case they went straight to no you don't have a case and and that is what led to me issuing a case against uh, the lawyers and the hospital uh, uh, myself now in uh, I repeat, in relation to the negligence involved with the death of my son, they set, the hospital settled with that out of, out of court. The, the issue was now where, you know, about the false information that they had given me and the, the false advice my lawyers had, 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 had provided me with. And um, as I said, this is where because they had no defense against my case, um, the only option was to, well, they, they, they had an option of settling it, but they chose to engage the influence of their friends and the root of corruption. The and corruption. now, you know, you know, the beauty of the this position we currently hold is that at some point, out of desperation, out of not knowing who to turn to, where to turn, to, to try to pursue this justice or, or in, I started writing to several members of parliament. I wrote to the queen and so on. And, and, and I received acknowledgements and responses and probably the most influential piece of evidence which I have in my possession today are the several letters that I received on, from Buckingham Palace written directly on behalf of the queen, uh, instructing the, my complaint to be passed to the head of the judiciary. And because they failed, the first letter from Buckingham Palace is dated January 1998. And in it, the letter said, 
the queen acts as a, 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 a constitutional sovereign and she's unable to intervene directly. However, she has instructed that my letter should be passed to Lord Irvine, the Lord Chancellor. Uh, uh, it went on to say, I know he is already aware of your case, but now he will also be aware of your approach to Her Majesty on this matter. And Irvine did nothing and allow a tiny little fraction to spiral out of control. And, um, you know, we've had appearances in court when we've gone to produce that letter from Buckingham Palace and the letter which we also had confirming what the judge and his brother or his brother's law firm did when he conducted those proceedings that led to my being kidnapped and brought to prison. When we attempted to produce those in court, they, the judges got up and, and, and ran out. We've had one judge who stuck his fingers in his ears saying, la, 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 as he was running at the same time. You know, um, I, the, again, as I said, <clears throat> because you have been upstanding and standing up for, 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 your, for your rights as a, as a father and, 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 and being prepared to suffer the consequences, uh, it's my absolute pleasure and, uh, to, 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 to work alongside you, stand in solidarity with you. Because mm -hmm. of what you've done with the banners that you've seen and so on and so forth. I mean, to, when you told me that, that your case at Preston Crown Court was, was, and this was last month when you told me, had been put on, off until December. Uh, you know, and when you said December 2021, <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, for me, it's fairly obvious, you know, because, because the, next, the, the next thing which they could have done is just to dismiss the case completely. But yeah. instead of giving you that benefit at such an early stage so that you can, you can get, have carte blanche to carry on doing what you're doing, they've just retained it on the books as though, you know, I can guarantee you they're not going to go to trial with that case. Do you think so? I can Absolutely guarantee you, but they've just put it off for us. I mean, we're talking about over a year. Over a year, 40 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's a breach of your rights. Even yeah. that is a breach of your rights. I remember because, you saying that. Yeah, you know, because you time. precisely. You know. So, sorry, my brother. No problem at all. And I'd love to touch on some of that stuff again. But the one thing I wanted to speak to you about because. Obviously, and thank you for saying that that you stand with me. You know, it's been a it's been a great, a real great honor to meet you, to be able to speak to you. And the first time you told me that I could join the campaign, and also that you'd stand with me, you know, it was like um, it was like an angel had been sent. It's a blessing, honestly, you know, because in the fight that I've had in the family courts, and this this isn't a criticism of the of the um, many many mothers and fathers, fathers in particular they are still trapped in the belief that many of these barristers and solicitors will help them when in actual fact they're being they're, they're having exactly what was done to you being done to them only they're in a, they have a kind of illusion a kind of scotoma where they they try to um justify the actions even though something inside them tells them that something's not right something so justice is not being adhered to but one thing I wanted to ask you is this. So you've told us how you, um, the evolution of how you came into fighting basically. But at that time, I assume that you didn't have many legal weapons because when I speak to you now, you're a man who knows about the law. Now there's many people who are fighting this system in terms of they're using stuff like the Magna Carta, common law descent and stuff like this. Um, ideologies to do with the straw man and all these kind of things which over the years i've read about and i've thought about but your approach is different so at what stage because you also mentioned going to prison for six years at what stage did you start to actually on start to understand the law and know that you could use the law against these people oh such a relevant question do you know in in the beginning from the time when they started 
uh, uh, basically denying me any protection of law by way of you know me dealing with them dealing with my lawful cases i then decided okay if you're not going to why should i obey the law if the law isn't going to protect me and so one of the things that i did <clears throat> first one of the things that i employed was to i i stopped paying and this isn't to do with the common law and straw men and so on, just, just so that we're absolutely clear. Yeah. I stopped, this is just defiance or civil disobedience. I decided that um, I wasn't going to pay car insurance, tax, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, I, and I, if I got stopped and they say, well, what about if you have an accident? I say, well, the state will be accountable because the state is responsible for putting me in this, position, in this position. Now, I was able to drive my vehicle for three years without tax. And if a police vehicle was be, um, following behind my car, as soon as they'd done the vehicle check, they would just do the next left or the next, the next right. The, the very first time I got stopped in my untaxed, uninsured vehicle, as soon as the police officer did, a, did the vehicle check, the next thing was he put his hand out to shake mine to say, okay, Mr. Grant, have a safe journey home. You know what I'm saying? And so, so I was doing that for a while, but it wasn't achieving anything other than myself not you know, having to pay for, for insurance. And then there was a time when I decided to step the ante up a little bit. In fact, I was in receipt of, of benefits. And they got in touch with me and they said, oh, it would appear that you were dismissed for um, gross misconduct. Therefore, we're going to have to uh, reconsider your, your benefits. So I said, OK, you know what, keep your money, but I'm going to find a way to, to feed my family, fund our campaign or get into court. So, so I started, I, start, I put that message out there and then I would be paid up to... I think that the most I ever got paid once was about twelve thousand pounds to go uh, all expenses paid to go to Barbados and pick up a package and bring it back and guarantee it's safe 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 return bring it in safely so so I, I did that for a while <clears throat> until um, I, I in fact one of the trip when I got stopped, I was coming back from Jamaica no. Let me, let me, um, uh, on one of my trips, the person whom I was going to meet, who I went to meet, they said, oh, I've never ever come across someone with so much confidence. Have you ever thought about doing this for yourself? So, so I hadn't, obviously, um, but, but because they approached me, I then, from that trip, when I got back, um, from what I got paid, I decided to invest £4,000 into a trip of my own. And from that four thousand pounds, I ended up making sixty thousand pounds upon my return to the UK. That was cannabis, and and so I was um, I was I put into place um, uh, an operation where I was going to raise about half a million pounds to really get behind our campaign and so on and so forth. But I was coming back from Jamaica with two suitcases, equal quantity of cannabis. One of them had my details on the other one didn't the one with my details they allowed to come through as normal but the other one they held back and and by and so they waited until everybody had collected their luggage and so on and i was the only one waiting and when the luggage when that suitcase was coming around i could already smell the the cannabis but i wasn't running the whole point was stop me and arrest me or leave me the hell alone. Um, so when it came, I picked it up and they swooped on me. And immediately I said, call Grant, campaign for truth and justice, et cetera, et cetera. Now we eventually went to trial and I put, presented my evidence, my defense of justification saying, yes, I did this. However, the only reason I did it is because of all these things all these, I tried every means possible to get into court the lawful way, and they slammed the doors in my face, allowed me to drive my car without tax, and, and all these things. However, the judge told the jury 
there is no defense of justification in English law. And that was a total misdirection. In fact, a total lie, because there are defenses of self-defense, first and foremost, duress of circumstances, necessity. Those are all defenses where the actor is not denying committing the act, but offering reasons and circumstances why they acted in the way they did. So yeah. they are defenses of justification. Now, okay, but one concession, one crucial concession that judge made in his summing up, he said, for the reasons he has put forward, he seeks an acquittal. Because if he's right, no court or jury can stop him or convict him of anything. And that, sadly, well, not, not sadly for me, but sadly for them, is the fact. And, and that's the thing that they, they've been afraid of. Now, now, for 45 kilos of cannabis, I got an eight-year prison sentence. And I was made to serve five years and four months of that uh, uh, eight years. And then they added another 18 months, for which I had to serve another nine months for failing, for not being able to give them the 85,000 pounds, which I had made over a 17 month period. Now, now, following the conviction, I applied to, uh, you know, I filed an application to appeal. It was rejected by the first judge. However, I renewed it to go into court to have an oral hearing. Now, they refused me, when the first judge rejected my application, he refused me legal aid, and they refused me my absolute right to come and represent myself. That was a violation of the law. That was a violation of course. the due process. And so that automatically rendered my conviction unlawful. Nonetheless, and despite the fact that during that six years, I issued four applications seeking the writ of habeas corpus. And those, an, an application for a writ of habeas corpus is not a matter which is dealt with on paper. It, the, the whole point of habeas corpus is that, that you cool, shall cool. produce the body. Precisely. Yeah. So, 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 so again, they violated the due process of, of, of law. And oh, thus... Cool. You know, the six years, you know, one of the things about my, uh, the reason why I made the point about the 45 kilos, whilst in prison, I came across someone who had 135 kilos of cannabis. They only got four years, did two and went home. Wow. There was another brother who had one ton of cannabis. He came in prison after me. He got an eight year sentence. He did his four years and went home. I, but they made me do five years and four months. So no halfway. And then, as I said, the additional nine months or 18 months, which I served nine. So six years and one month because they were, how on earth were they going to control me once they uh, released me? And just, uh, you know, on, upon my release, I think it was six or seven months later, they gave me a job working in local government. I was working for, for Serco, for goodness sake. Who for was Serco, wow. Wow, how is that today? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got so, two um, questions then. I've got two questions and, and, and one would be, how would, how, firstly, how were they able to deny you the right to self-represent? How did they do that practically? And then the other one is, in terms of, was it in prison that you learn about the intricacies of, because you said that you was doing like writs of habeas corpus. I tried to do the same when I was locked up, but had no real way of understanding how I would do it. And when I went to the, because I was led to believe that by me simply writing to the governor, he was supposed to bring me in front of a court. Didn't do it. You, 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 you obviously have all the relevant um, um, and important uh, uh, questions because the, your questions even remind me, um, because whilst in prison, obviously because I was representing myself at my cannabis trial, um, one day I complained that I get limited time in the prison library and I can't take any of the books, law books back to myself. However, I had a friend who was sending me in 
law books. And this judge, I'm suppo I suppose in his arrogance, because I know he weren't trying to be helpful, but in his arrogance, he said, I'm issuing an order that you should have access to your law books. So that evening when I returned, when they brought me back to the prison, uh, I was met by the governor who handed me those books that already had been sent in. Okay. And thereafter, any law book my friend sent was, was, came straight to my cell. So in the end, I ended up with a, a, like a law library. And because I was, they kept me in the cell by myself, um, I was able to spend my time. I, I, I always put it this way, that rather than serving time, I made time serve me. So I spent my six years in prison studying the law. And that's probably been their worst um, uh, uh, a nightmare. I'm sure there was another question you asked, but it's I'm slipped not, me. Yeah, I'm, I, you should say you said something else. Maybe we can come, I, I'll remind you of that if it comes back to me. But um, you Habeas said, corpus. Say again? Habeas corpus, you asked about that as yeah. well. Yes. Yeah, so. So I had, because prior to going to prison, I had utilized that procedure before when I was trying to get somebody else out of prison. And I realized how powerful that was because when we made the application, um, of course it was, we, we were able to, firstly, they tried to, 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 to um, delay me doing it because they said, they said to me, oh, I have to get a letter from the person in prison to confirm that you know, because who knows, he might be an enemy and I want to get him out to bash his head in. So, yeah. so I had to um, get them to write to me confirming that they would like me to represent them uh, on this application, which we, which we did, which I did. Now, when the hearing was supposed to take place, when the hearing was supposed to take place, they, the judge dismissed it, saying that he had an appeal, saying that the, the person whom I was trying to present the habeas corpus had an, an appeal pending and that was total lie he didn't have no appeal but within a few days they released him released him from 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 prison because at that time we the force that we were moving with then was in the very early stage and i think you know they didn't know how to deal with, they had no idea how to deal with us at at that time and um uh, so obviously the six years that they had me locked up and because it didn't result in any kind of reprisals from the community, not, I'm not blaming the community for anything, but um, because it didn't result in anything like that, they kind of took a little bit of comfort and, 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 and took the time to try and think how they were going to deal with the situation in the future. And part of it was to, you know, try to avoid me coming into court. Yeah. And, 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 and um, you know, so by any means necessary. And again, as I said, the first thing they did was to um, make sure that I was in full time employment and so on. And, um, and yeah. That in itself kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, um, they were realizing that you could actually hurt the system by giving you some kind of compensation of work, really. So one of the things you said as well was um, they denied you the ability to represent yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. How did yeah. you do that in practical terms? So because they had me in prison, they, they, they you know what, I'm so glad you reminded me. Um, because even when I, on one of the habeas corpus applications which I made, the prison governor at that prison where I was at that time, the governor said as long as, because he had come to learn about how I came to be there, that governor said to me, as long as I get a hearing it, on the day when I'm supposed to be in court, if there's no transport available to bring me to court and he's on his day off, he'll come in personally and come and take me to court. You know, but <laughs> at the time that this was the last application which I made. And at that time, Lord Justice Thomas, he hadn't become the Lord Chief Justice he, as yet, but he sent a fax or his staff sent a fax through to the prison authorities directing that they should not produce me for my own hearing. And fortunately, I mean, the governor was kind enough to give me a copy of that fax to confirm that it's not us and it's not them that's preventing me from going to court. 
they've been direct they've been directed to break the law effectively you yeah. know and i and fortunately i have like as with every other thing that i've told you whether it's about the time when when officers came and, and arrested me for um for breach of alleged breach of bail condition i have a copy of the custody record whether it's you know the fact that um, I was on bail, but with no condition. I have an extract from the court confirming that there was no conditions attached to my bail. And as I just mentioned about this fax from, the, from Lord Justice Thomas directing that I should not be produced. So you ask, again, a very important question because something I haven't mentioned because we haven't gotten to it as yet is that recently, we have managed to finally get these issues into court and they are pending a hearing on the 30th of November. Uh, this is 25 years of struggle. So, 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 so in recent times, now I'm currently on bail for another act of civil disobedience and um, uh, uh, they, they, and uh, there's one condition attached to my bail that I shouldn't be in touch with Curry's, this particular address and so on. Now, I was supposed to, this matter should have gone up on Friday for the first appearance. However, ahead of that, they wrote to me to say that um, uh, um, the matter has been adjourned until Monday the 9th. So Monday coming will be the first time I'm going. However, they specified why they were conditions attached to my bail. And they, they said, to pre no, to prevent me uh, interfering with witnesses or to um, interfering with the due process of justice in my own case or anybody else's case. I mean, that's crazy and, and, and ludicrous. To prevent me interfering with the due process of justice in my own case. And here is what I think was a, they were set in a trap because my nephew who had an appeal um, yesterday at Inner London Crown Court, I was initially helping him with that. Helping him? Yeah, helping him with that. And um, so with that little clause um, of interfering with anybody else's case, and on Monday, there's another brother, he was on, the reparations march got arrested during the reparations march and his case was due at the same magistrates courts that i'm due to on monday so i thought hold on it looks as if they've set were set in a trap yeah. so that they could curtail my liberty mm -hmm. and then prevent me from being available in person to conduct the proceedings on the 30th of, of november that's what i think these people were up to well to to the lay person a lot of people would think, oh, no, that sounds very conspiratorial and very um, intricate. But to somebody like myself and yourself who's been in the system and knows how to work, it's not, it's not anything that is too much for them. They seem to know everything that's going on and they seem to, you know, put the, put the, the obstacles in our paths very cleverly. Now, Absolutely. earlier you mentioned that when you was in prison, you saw people that would come in and do time while you were still there. And the other day I was speaking to the somebody and um, I, told, I told them that um, they look at me worse than they look at a criminal because I'm fighting the system. Yeah. Now, would you elaborate on that? Because obviously the fact that they were keeping in prison for so long outside the realms of what was legally right, because every, every so-called crime, every... Um, offence has a statutory limit of time that you can keep a person for depending yeah. on certain things so how, how do you how do you think the system actually looks at somebody like you who is fighting them in, in that way well I mean clearly one of their hope or desire is 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 that if you know firstly that maybe I become broken yeah maybe people start looking at you like you got mental health issues yeah. and you know this the other thing i do not put beyond the system is where they are sufficiently threatened they're clearly prepared to kill now let me give two examples of my personal experience 
because that time when they came and arrested me and accusing me of breach of bail conditions, they, they, when they, now I always, whenever I'm in police custody, I try to avoid food, drink and sleep. Yeah. And on this occasion, on the 12th of March, 1998, um, when I had employed those uh, principles whilst in custody, and at one point, in, I had dozed off. And I jumped up out of, now when you're in custody, you probably experienced this yourself in the police cell, whenever they're looking in on you, they make all the, they make those shutters make as much noise as possible. Now, on this occasion, as I said, I, I've dozed off for a few seconds, jumped up out of my sleep to find two police officers creeping into the cell and the cell door was wide open. And it, those days you could keep your watch, um, you know, you didn't have to hand in your watch. And I checked the time, it was 2 a.m. And they said to me, oh, we've just changed shifts and we was wondering if you wanted something to eat. Now a prisoner is sleeping and you're opening the door, got the door to find out if they want something to eat. Yeah. Now, I believe had they gotten close enough to me, they would have smothered me and I would have become another black death in custody. The second incident was in wow. 2013. Boom. <laughs> yeah, 2013. I, I, I had just come home from work and had my dinner and just about to sit down and put my feet up. And the door knock. Oh, hello, call. We've got an, uh, allegations that you've been threatening to behead children on the streets of London. I said, I beg your pardon? Yeah, threatening to behead children on the streets of London. You're going to have to come with us, I'm afraid. So I've, I've gone and I thought, okay, this is going to be over in no time because there is no such evidence of me threatening to behead children on the streets of London. So they've taken me into custody. Now, as usual, <laughs> I, I maintain to, to um, represent myself. Now, had, once they had interviewed me and so on and so forth, and I'm there lying in the cell, and I'm thinking, this is, because they've now decided no bail. So, so I'm thinking, this is unusual. They would normally grant bail, especially since everything else had happened. And, and then I, I just thought, do you know what? Let me, call, let me ask them to call a solicitor because there was a law firm who previously came and uh, protested with us outside the high court. So, so they called the, the, the lawyer and when I spoke to the lawyer and told him that they'd charged me for malicious communication and he said, oh, no worries, I'll get you out right now. And when that lawyer spoke to the sergeant, the duty duty sergeant, he said, I'm not letting him out because if he goes out there and harms someone, it's going to be on top of my head. Then the lawyer came back to me and said, oh, don't worry, just keep your head down and I'll get you out tomorrow. So tomorrow, when they, the next day when they brought me to the police station, so I, you know, let me, when they brought me to the police, uh, to the um, court, they kept me downstairs all day and then eventually brought me up late evening only to be released on unconditional bail, no mention of no threatening to behead ch ch children. I fear if I had not retained the services of a lawyer, they would have definitely remanded me in custody and then spread rumors in the prison that I was threatening to harm children and wow. I would have probably ended Finish. up dead inside. Finish. Finished off, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Now, 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 the strength of this case, or the, the, the weakness of their case, ultimately, eventually, when this matter was, even the, even the malicious communication, when it was to go to trial, they could offer no, no witness. So it was, the case was just dismissed. That is, that is in, in my personal belief, that that was an attempt, to, 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 uh, an attempt on, on, on my life. Yeah. You know, um, so, so, and I think, I think as well, because initially that period, that six year imp imprisonment, they wouldn't, they, they made sure that not even the hair on my body got harmed because they, they knew that the community would have said they killed him. They yeah. killed him. 
they killed him. But on, by 2013, um, this was a few years after my release, because the campaign had not gotten back up to the same level as it did before they had me locked, up, locked away, I think they, 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 they resigned themselves into the belief that um, if he was to disappear, no one would bat an eyelid. And so they were ready to, to, to chant at, at, my, um, at my life. Now it's come back now that they, now I think they'll be petrified now if anything happened to me. Yeah. Because we, the community is fully aware that we've got this case filed in the High Court and it's pending a hearing. And they are desperate. Well, you know, I'm just making a note because you raise a few things that are very important. When you say, because it kind of, what you said there kind of brings it back to what happened to me with the fact that when I got arrested, you see, there came, so many things conspired on the, on the last time when I got arrested to make their plan fall to pieces. For instance, this place that I'm in now is a new place. So they didn't have any yeah. really any address and anything like that for me. Mm -hmm. But they went to the previous address and they were given right. the wrong address. Yeah. So then they called me and asked mm -hmm. me where I was. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I'll come to the police station. I don't want you to, and they were like, no, we want to come for mm -hmm. you. So I just put mm -hmm. down the phone and said, I'll come to the police station. And in that time, I was able to contact you and a few other people. Yeah. So that kind of sparked a whole, you know, I couldn't say much to people because I knew that my time was limited. Yeah. So it kind of sparked a lot of stuff. And it was only after spending the entire weekend in prison and after coming out, I saw what people were doing. So this is such a very important question, really, because you said about the community and the campaign getting back to this stage. How important do you think it is for people? Because there's a lot of people fighting single-handedly and a lot of people can be taken out of the game. Because when you said that you have no doubt that they would kill you and stuff like this, um, again, some people will think that this is fantasy land, you know, it's Will Smith, enemy of the state. But the facts are the true that people do get killed in prison. People do yeah. go missing. People get yeah. killed in the police stations. Um, yeah. Or should I say people die? Because we don't get an answer as to why, how they died. Mm. But if we believe that it's possible for the state to kill you if you become a threat, how important do you think it is for people to stop fighting alone and start involving the community and, and people to actually start understanding what is going on in this system? Well, it's absolutely crucial. And, um, you know, that's why, that's why the, 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 the system maintains such level of division amongst the people, whether it's, whether it's using um, uh, racism, whether right. it's using... Yeah things of, um, um, you know, so, so even now, the, the tool that they're using to maintain division is those who wear masks against those who don't wear masks, who so. choose to wear a mask and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, so there, there's no question that, you know, if you're, if you're on a bus now and you're not wearing a mask, those who are wearing a mask are looking at you like you're, you're responsible for spreading the virus and so on yeah. and so forth. <clears throat> you know, so, so they, 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 as you quite rightly say, the, the peop, people will, you know, think that, you know, you're deluded and, and so on and so forth. And as they say, um, what's the saying? Um, <coughs> a first, first day, no, one person, campaigning by themselves <clears throat> they see as oh you know something wrong with them probably mental health or whatever um but then when it gets to a few then people start to turn turn their heads and so on and so forth and as i say the state or the establishment relies on on division but it is absolutely crucial one of the things which we did when we um uh, over 2014 to 2016 we, we um, had what we call Empowerment Mondays outside the, the High Court. So every Monday, and what I did there was to invite um, others to come and join that platform to bring their issues, 
So, you know, um, because as you pointed out, one person fighting alone, they can be swallowed up by the city, whichever way. And, 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 so, and so rather than being a lone ranger, if you like, let's all get together. We're, we're fighting to expose the, how corrupt the system is, whether it's in the family courts, the um, county courts or the criminal courts, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we, we, I think that was very, very um, powerful. And without the support of the community, I, wouldn't, I couldn't have reached where, where, where I am today. I could not have reached where I am today. You know, um, and the thing was, what caused the, what, what initially, what caused our campaign to really rise so rapidly is because um, when, when members of the community came and sat in the courtroom, uh, in, in the public gallery, and to see a judge getting up and running out, and, and my brother, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not saying, oh, they walked out, I'm not dealing with this today, or this is, a, and, 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 you know, get up, run in, like they're running, like someone has just shouted fire, yeah? And, and so when members of the community saw that, they thought, wow, you know, and they've never seen anything like that before. Very I've got empowering. Sorry? It must be very empowering to see that because the thing is the judges, I'll just say this, when I was um, in, in prison the first time, I've been in prison twice on remand, the first time was a real um, education because I remember making a bail application mm -hmm. and myself from the cell, and then when they randomly came and got me saying that I'm going to a bail hearing, I was like, wow, my, no own, my own piece of paper, not on any official yeah. paper, just a normal piece of paper, it got me a bail hearing with the judge. So I thought, well, if that's the case, I'm going to get, I'm going to get bail. I didn't get bail. Mm. But my point was mm. that when I didn't get bail that time, I almost felt like crying because I, I literally begged the judge. I'd never been in prison yeah. before. I almost yeah. begged the judge. And the only reason why I didn't cry, yeah, was because there was two prison officers because it wasn't, it, I didn't, I wasn't taken to physical court. It was done by a yeah. video. Yeah. Link. Yeah. Yeah. So I was still in the prison, but officially it's in court. Um, yeah. There was two prison officers there and I knew that I couldn't show any weakness in that place. Mm. So, mm. but over a period of time, that, when I left that, that, that court, that room, I said to myself, I will never ask a judge for anything else. And over a period mm. of time, because they kept bringing me out in and out, of prison, out mm. in and out of court while I was locked up to force mm. me to plead guilty. Um, right. My fear of my fear of the judge broke down, broke down, broke down. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to trial, now I think he just was like another man to me, just another yeah. guy. On me, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is. For those people in the public gallery to, to see the judge run is a very powerful thing because they're seeing somebody who many people look at as a god. I've seen people yeah. bowing, bowing to yeah. these men, you know, yeah. oh, your honor, they'll knock on the door, your honor, it's time, mm -hmm. he'll come out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's an empowering thing that you're doing, it's an empowering mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring it back to the because obviously. The way that you're standing against them is powerful. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about the weapons you're using now. Mm -hmm. Because I was led to believe this, and it's something that I've been thinking about. Oh, there's so many things I want to say, but... Because um, at the moment, I'm represented for this new thing. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, I'll leave that. What I want to say is this. The tools that you're using in terms of... You talked about the 31st of this month. 30th of this month. The 30th, sorry. Sorry, the 30th of this month, November. And you also spoke about people joining with their causes and the system not wanting you to bring this stuff into court. People might be thinking, why are they afraid of bringing you into court? You're going to be prosecuted for one thing. But you have knowledge that any time somebody brings you into court, when the state brings you into court, you can actually use those proceedings against the state. So, for instance, they might be prosecuting you for stealing something, or but if you have certain ground, you can use those prosecutors. So, what is that based on? What law or what is that based on? Okay, so so fundamentally, we're looking at the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act is a law 
designed to keep public authorities in check. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, so section six one, first and foremost, makes it unlawful that section six one of the Human Rights Act 1998 makes it unlawful for a public authority to act in any way which is incompatible with the rights enshrined within that law, that act. Yeah. Now, so that's the first first thing. Then in, in that same section six, there is section six six, which says a, uh, an act includes a failure to act. Now we've we've just added this to our armory uh, or weaponry or toolbox recently. So um, can I clarify that? Can I clarify? It, yeah. Six isn't six fair trial? No, the, no. Uh huh. Good question. Because because there is article. There are articles. Articles 1, Article 2, Article 3, Article 6 is the right to a fair trial. But Section 6 is different to Article. Section 6, the sections is basically an explanation of what you can do with these laws. So again, another section, Section 7, which you just referred to, Section 7, one mm -hmm. of, of, of um, the Human Rights Act, Remember, there's Article 7 as well. Article 7, no punishment without law. But Section 7.1 states, a person who claims to be a victim of an unlawful act may rely on that in any legal proceedings instigated against them by the state. Yeah. And, of course, Section 7.1b, a person may bring proceedings against the relevant authority um, for, you know, in the relevant court and so on and so forth. So there's no question. This is how, this is how, um, uh, because we've acquired that knowledge, you know, so that if they were, pros if they're prosecuting me for, I don't know, well, like the last thing that they were, we, the last act of civil disobedience which I engaged was I, I went to a petrol station, I filled my tank, I left my details and I didn't pay. I, I, in fact, I co contacted Scotland Yard in advance and told them I was going to do it. And they gave me a CAD number to confirm the call. And I, on the back of one of my business cards, I wrote the CAD number at, uh, and gave it to the petrol attendant. And I said, call the police, let them know, quote them this number so that it will confirm that I've been here and, or, and so on. And, um, uh, subsequently, I was arrested and prosecuted and was awaiting trial, um, which should have taken place July 20th and 21st of this year. However, on the 14th of July, I received an email informing me that the prosecution had um, sought a mention on the 10th of July um, in my absence, and they offered, chose to offer no evidence, and therefore that was the end of the proceedings and and the court needed to know from me if those if the process had cost me any out of pocket expenses remember wow. i broke the law wow. but now they were they were offering to pay me any out of pocket expenses i had suffered as a result of that prosecution because wow. they had mm. and again i'd like the people that might be listening to understand here because we're not trying to give um um, we're not trying to show roots of taking on the system without giving full knowledge that you're not talking about just going in there trying to avoid um, guilt in a, in a certain area. You're going in there, although you're armed with those sections from the human rights, you have actually got evidence to back up wrongdoing with the judiciary. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've got Absolutely. two weapons there. You've got their law, or yeah. our law, should I say. Oh, yeah. Well, I say. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and also evidence. Evidence. Absolutely. Now, the next thing that this brings me to is this. Now, you know what's happening with my case, and um, I've told you certain things that I've done. Now, I'm going to explain stuff, and I want you to give me why, because I I I know why. You know, we've spoken about it, but I want you to explain from your point of view why I think it'd be powerful. Now, at the moment, I have representation, and these are the same, this is the same representation, a firm called Kellogg's, um, who were actually the duty solicitors when I was locked up. Um, 
I've met with them once and the, the time I met with them was prior to me pleading in the Crown Court. Now, the Friday before meeting with them on the Monday, I went and I, and I, and I got an affidavit done. The mm -hmm. affidavit, two page document, it included, um, again, it stated to, to them that um, I'm not saying I'm not guilty of what you said because you claim that I've spoken the names of my children and mentioned two judges. So the affidavit basically said why I'd done it. It said that it told them that the evidence that I have to convict, well, or to um, bring against judges, showing that they've broken the law. Um, I also explained about the campaign and yourself and the rights that you've mentioned. And this is all in the affidavit. So I got this done on a Friday at a different solicitors, not Kellogg's. Mm -hmm. But then I went, I got it. So an affidavit is where you sign you, you, under oath. And similar mm -hmm. to what you're saying about contempt in court, if I was to lie in that affidavit, I could face time in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the same as being in a court and taking the oath and saying, I swear on the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the solicitors, I swore. Um, so on the Monday now, I took it to the solicitors, knowing that I was going to plead on, this, on the Tuesday, and I said to them, I want you to file this with the CPS and the courts by tomorrow before I plead. And they said, no problem, we'll, we'll fax this over to the barrister. As you know, they can just upload things onto the system so everybody in the case has got it. So there's no issue with that. It's not a mail thing, it's an upload thing. Yeah. Um, but when I went to plead in the morning now, I said to the barrister, was you able to um, serve my affidavit? No, we don't, think we, we don't think it's needed. And to this day, I keep on emailing them, the solicitors, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. making any pressure. I'm just logging every time that I instruct them to do something and they don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so each time, um, like I said, each, I, I've had to... I was ignored so many times with emailing the person that was dealing with me that I, I decided to go to the boss of the firm and then they got back to me and said, well, there's a schedule. We don't think you should put in the affidavit and um, we don't need to do anything until December when our defence statement will be going in. Mm -hmm. So what I want to ask you is this. Now, I've instructed them to put that in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I instruct them. They've got legal aid mm -hmm. on my heart. Mm -hmm. If they believed that I was doing the wrong thing, they would base, they should say to me, well, Mr. Dow, we don't think that's a good idea, but if you wish to do it, we're instructed by you, so we will do it. Mm -hmm. But they've, they've just tried to ignore it, blanket. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Well, you know what, you know what when, if you think back on section six, 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 because these things are, people are likely to behave and can behave in this way, you know, fail to act. So that's why intricately the law has, has spelt it out. So, so they, they know, they know themselves why, I mean, they probably discussed it with whoever already. So they know. And so it is, it is just as, for the same reason that I can't get a lawyer to come into court to, with, on my behalf and say, um, Article 7, no punishment without law. You can't do anything because Mr. They won't go in there and say. That's no. why I represent myself. Mm. So, um, so it, it, to me, it's just proof of the weight of behind your, whatever you want to say, why they are reluctant. They won't tell you, oh, no, this is a load of rubbish or this or, as you say, they won't advise you accordingly. They just, they just kind of, um, um, dragging their feet over it and and in a way I've got them in a, in a, in a hard position because they're supposed to be going in, they're supposed to be fighting on my behalf against Absolutely. yeah but it's Absolutely. almost if they can't do it because they're part of that they can't go against exactly. them because they're part of it exactly it? And it could, sorry I was going to say it could end up worse them saying oh um, we can't um, we can't go on representing you then there's a possibility you could end up representing yourself that yeah, would make it worse for them worse for them and here's yeah because we're in a catch yeah. 22 and to be honest <laughs> they can't drop me as a client because they put themselves no. in, i'd be able to sue them if they, you know 
I've yeah. not done anything wrong. I've not been aggressive yeah. to them or nasty to them. If they were to just drop me as a client saying, okay, we don't want to deal with you, then they'd be putting them in a situation where I'd be able to sue these people. Absolutely. You know, you know so, I mean, this is, a lot of people have said to me, you know, they've got in touch and they've said, oh, you know, I'm sorry that the prosecuting, I'm sorry this and that. And I think to myself, well, I'm not sorry at all because I'm able to go into that courtroom and show the evidence of your wrongdoing. It's yeah. your wrongdoing that's actually put me in here. Yes, I've said, yeah. I've, I've basically said the names of two judges and my children's names and you're going to prosecute me for this. So yeah, it's very, very, very powerful. And thank you for saying that. Now you also, I've also told you that the, the, and the reason why I'm saying this is to bring it back to the fact that we're dealing with a system. Now, the attorney general, when I was locked up, I was writing to the attorney general, seeking mm -hmm. help and stuff like that, no help. And the attorney general got in touch a little while ago and threatened prosecution also if I didn't remove three videos. I remember speaking to you and I also decided that nothing was going to get removed. Mm -hmm. To this date, they've done nothing against me. Nothing mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Again, why do you think that is? That the yeah. highest I, power? Yeah. I, I think, I think, I mean, I know from, from my standing what the what the benefits are of of um you know i know as i just mentioned to you about uh, about this um being found not guilty for um taking petrol which i i admitted to i did and so on and so forth um especially especially when someone is able to stand up and address the court themselves because you pick up quite easily and they don't know what extent of knowledge you have but but having any at all and be able to come into court and say but i've i've, I've spoken to mr grant for in school grant for instance and i have evidence i can produce him as a witness in these proceedings that you the judiciary is acting unlawfully and and so on and so forth you know the fact that you're in a position to do that it puts you in equal position to myself if you like and 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 them being fearful but if you were if you kind of gave any kind of indication that you're uncertain you're not sure and 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 so on if if you didn't if you weren't prepared to stand up and face the consequences then they would just bully you i've yeah. i've got a family again i know many people talk about these things in common law but i've got a family whose home we have been protecting for the past 12 months because they were on the verge of being evicted. They had been served with an eviction notice and she contacted me and um, I said, okay, this is the best I can do, etc." And I drafted the document on campaign for truth and justice head, um, letterhead. And I said, to whom it may concern. In, accord, in accordance with Clause 61 and Article 7 of the Human Rights Act, et cetera, et cetera, this property has been seized by Campaign for Truth and Justice. Any attempt to enter without consent could, or invitation, could result in injury to persons. You have been warned. You and so on. And I, right? <laughs> and, 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 and I was there on the day when they should have been evicted. I was there with another member of Campaign for Truth and Justice. We were inside. We saw the bailiffs turn up. There's about five of them turn up. They read the notice on the door. They took pictures. They've made their phone calls and they got back in their vehicles and went away. Yeah? And that family has been in, in their home ever since. I mean, th this is something they cannot, if they had, if they were able to lawfully ignore what was written on that on that door and the notice on that door they would have simply called the police and said look we we've got a court in enforcement order here we need you, your assistance so that no one gets hurt if you like or no breach of the peace etc um but the the the, the state authorities know 
that our aim is to is to get into court by any means necessary and yeah. that couple as i said earlier on just like yourself because you're prepared to stand up because you're prepared to suffer the consequences but as long as you get the opportunity to have your voice heard then you become you become someone almost almost untouchable because you're using the letter of the law and yeah. they well, you know as i said earlier on i had a, a a radio interview earlier on this morning um it is either the law applies to all or it applies to none none yeah either it applies to all or it applies to none at all and what well, they're not going to they're not going to accept or acknowledge that they're above the law they're not they they cannot no, say they they're above the law they can't. precisely precisely and they don't seem to be able to ever you know a lot of the times when i was locked up the first time you know i'd be writing stuff and this was mainly to the cps in terms of this and i because i was thinking if i show them where the where the where their corruption is or where they've gone wrong they're going to have to let me out of prison no nothing i did or said ever to turn them around because mm -hmm. It seemed as if they're unwilling to accept their failings, unwilling to look. Because like you said earlier, if they do, it could make the whole system crumble. Sorry, I won't ask you a question. I won't ask, this is a very important question. If you want to say anything, go ahead, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, we may not have the physical force, so like when they have us locked up in prison, we don't have the physical force to get out, but yeah. we have the moral force of the law. We have the force yeah. of the law and the moral force of the law. And the moral force, yeah. And when, when we're at liberty like this, they cannot stop us exercising that right in the appropriate place. When, yeah. when we're in prison, they can curtail. That's, that's how they, they kept me in there for six years. That's how they would, they would love to be able to have me in prison now to be able to avoid the 30th of november of course you know? yeah <laughs> yeah likewise yeah. likewise and and that's why i feel so blessed and again i'm thankful to yourself and other people you know it was so beautiful and moving when i came out and i saw what people had done and you know but here, here's here's the thing when you say because when i was locked up yeah they they prevented my fair trial they controlled the trial and I think when I, when, I, when I represented myself and, and was found not guilty, they, they were stunned. It stunned yeah. them to the core. Yeah. Now, what advice would you have? Because when I was in the family court, which I still am in, in a way, when I was in the family court, I believed that it was corrupt because it was secret. And then I became very shocked that the, the Crown Court was just as corrupt however there's a different kind of corruption within the family court because as i say it's secret so they're getting away with a lot of things that are kind of done more openly in a sense because there's no public gallery there's no jury and so forth what advice would you give to people i'm gonna ask for your advice in the family court and also i'd ask for your advice for other people in certain other circumstances but what advice would you give to fathers, mothers who are fighting in the family court in ways that they can use the law to empower themselves that don't really involve these lawyers, barristers, solicitors? You know, I, it, with the family courts, um, the, the main problem is, as you say, because they're secret. Now, I, can, I understand in terms of the protection of the children um, why they might be secret. But but if these people, if these people could be trusted to act according to the law and so on, then you know one might support the secret, the so-called secrecy of the family courts, because you, you, irrespective, you don't want your children exposed in a way that they shouldn't be or don't, uh, yeah, shouldn't be as 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 young children, so that the whole world is aware of whatever it is that's going on between their, their, their parents. Um, um, however, you know, in, I mean, I've been in the family courts with, 
with uh, with a family who would approach. In fact, in fact, um, the father had a Mackenzie friend, and the mother had had someone else as a Mackenzie friend, and the mother had me as a Mackenzie friend, and that's how I was able to go into family court, and and argue on behalf of the mother. Now they had taken three of their, three or four, three of their children, uh, two boys, one, four of their children away from them. And, one, and the youngest was a baby. And um, whilst the, 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 the reason they had identified to, to take the children, they were saying that the mother had a drink problem and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, it had gotten to the point where she had got over her her um, drink problem. She had gone through all the tests to confirm, and so on, that uh, you know she no longer, or she, at, you know, during that time had, didn't have a, a the, the same drink problem. Um, but the, the social services were saying that the the grown the the older children didn't want to come home, and and so on, and which was a total lie. So they were they were actually lying. Because eventually it turns out the boys were even trying, the boys had even ran away from, from their foster parents. Um, but with the, the youngest being a baby, um, um, when, when we went to court to try and get the children back, or in particular the young baby, um, social services came in court and they said, they said they don't believe that, you know, the mother won't go back to drinking and so on and so forth. And for that, those reasons, they were reluctant to give the baby back. So fortunately, I was, the judge allowed me to speak as a Mackenzie friend. So I, I, I spoke with the, to the um, social services worker and I, and I said to her, I said to her, the, the position you've taken, if a prison officer took that position, that would mean if someone who had been sentenced to a term of imprisonment had served their time and was about to be released, the, the governor could say, hold on a moment, I'm not convinced you're not going to commit that crime again, so therefore I'm not prepared to release you. I said the prison governor can't do that. So why, if she has served her sentence and she no longer has the, the, the issue with alcohol, why are you denying her right to have her child? And I think on that very basis, the judge gave back, gave them back their, their little daughter who was two at the time. Um, uh, so if they act according to the law and even, and more importantly with the social services as well, if they act in, and not just using these children as, as, money-making machines, if you, if you like, because, because putting, when uh, foster caring is, is very rewarding, I understand. Very much you so. Know, indeed. So, and, and they need children in order to maintain that part of the establishment and so on. So, so uh, you know, the advice, what advice would I, would I give to them? Uh, you know, I, I think, I don't know how we deal with the secrecy aspect because I I agree with the the anonymous the anonym, the, the children remaining anonymous. Mm -hmm. I agree with their um, identity not being exposed to others, and so you know so that potentially whether they you know they could be ridiculed for oh this is what's happening your parents are this and that. you know if it should come out in if it was made public like in the way that, um, let's say, in the criminal court uh, um, are. Um, on the other hand, with the lawyer, again, it's, it's so, so, so difficult. I, I, don't think, I don't think, you know, people going through those circumstances, I, I'm gonna say we, I don't think we have a lot of option, uh, options. You know, it's mm -hmm. either we engage them or, or or, you know, and, and we do so at a point where we don't know if we're better off representing. Well, if we don't know the procedure, then, you know, we've got no choice but to, but to employ them. If we maybe, if, if it's open to us to study the law, learn about the procedures and so on. And, you know, where do we start?
Do we start by studying family law? Do we start by studying criminal law? I think, I think you know what, one of the things I learned along the way is that the country has an obligation to teach the people about it, their rights. The people, the, they have an obligation, a United Nations obligation to teach the people about their rights and how they can use those rights, but they don't. Well, this brings me to the, the other question I was gonna ask. With the current situation then, in the world, in the country, the way rights are being taken away and you know, there's going to be a time, I mean, this is the time actually when a lot of people are going to find themselves in courts for non-payment of fines, um, for breaking this rule, for breaking that rule, maybe even in the future for not taking or wearing masks or not taking vaccines. What is the way then? Because the thing is, um, people don't really actually know their rights, do they? In any way, shape and or form. Indeed, and that's where the that's where the problem lies. It's not knowing, it, and and you know what, the, the the establishment has made sure that it protects itself by saying ignorance of the law is no excuse. No. So they say, do you know what I'm saying? Mm. It's, it's not it's not my fault that you don't know your rights. Um, you know, there was a time we all this information that because we got in touch with one particular department. And that gave us access to all this free information that they're supposed to be handing out to the public and so on. They're supposed to teach the people about, when they introduce the Human Rights Act, for instance, it's supposed to teach the people about what every single article in that meant and what it means to their lives and how, if they are wrong, how, if they are affected by any of those things, how they can utilize it. But, but, they, but they haven't. And, and, but they did make information available. And for instance, they, they just regarded it as, because they published in the national newspapers, you know, it might be published in the, in the Telegraph, but I don't read the Telegraph, but they don't publish in, in the Mirror, for instance, but they publish, so as far as they were concerned, they've done their diligent, their, their obligation, they've carried out, they've informed, whereas, because of I pressed this particular button, there were all this information that they were sending me that I was then able to give out freely to members of the community. Learn, know your rights. In a little handout, the Human Rights Act, what each article meant, what the sections of the Human Rights Act means, and so on and so forth. And as I said, along with these law books, that was initially, that was the basic of where I got my knowledge from and just compounded with the, the, what I've then read in, 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 in law books. And if people had the basic, and you know the basic, the basic, if you like, where you stood, where you stood. As a fun, the, I remember the first time ever that I learned when my, when following the breakup of my marriage, which I mentioned earlier, and my wife, um, um, her lawyers um, having me come to a family court to 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 say that I can only see my daughter um, maybe for two hours twice a week or I think it may have been twice a week or, or once a week for two hours and I thought what my own daughter you're telling me that the the state can tell me I can only see my own daughter for X amount I couldn't believe it I could not believe it at that time and 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 you know I, I think some of these some of where i started from is just by gut feeling this doesn't feel right this doesn't it's it's how can this possibly be right and i and i initially fought started fighting with the, with, with until you know eventually had, having access to the law and and studying and so on and so forth but um i don't know what what we i think you know, we've been, we're all being tested now. Yeah. In, you know, in a way that we've never been tested before. Very true. Um, in this so called plan, pan, scan, demic, whatever, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And, and, you know, they've got a good percentage of the people believe absolutely in what they are doing. And then the other half that say, you know, this is, this, we're not having it, yeah. you know. It really does um, feel like a fight for humanity, really, does it? Yeah. But 
for our yeah. humanity. It does. I, I think we're very much at the turning point in humanity. Um, yeah. One of the things that has come to me in the last couple of weeks or so, and I've, I've, it's come to me before. I've read certain things, but it's come back. And sometimes, as you know, you'll read something a few years ago, it will resonate with you. And then a few, you know, it might resonate again. And it kind of ties in with something I saw you post, if not yesterday, the day before. And it's the idea of natural law, the law of the natural law of what's right and wrong. When you came up, when you, you sparked that because you said that you was told you could only see your child for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. In the same way, the state has the power to say that I cannot say my children's names. You know, my, the, chil the, na the children that I named who came from mm. me, I can't mm. say the names. Mm. Well, <laughs> the mm. natural law, and you wrote Mahat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on one of your stories. Mm. Um, and I thought about this because I've been contemplating, and I will be doing it, a, um, a series called the satanic, ex the satanic Family Court Extortion System. Mm. Now, a lot of the times when I use the word satanic, people are thinking about horns and devils and so mm. forth. Mm. When I use the term, I know that certain satanists talk about turning things on its head, upside mm. down, saying things in reverse. And it's because I look at something satanic as a reversal of the natural order of something. Mm. And I believe that mm. natural law and that judges are supposed to uphold a natural law like Mahat. Mm. And that what's happened in this system is that it's been inverted for profit. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So would you concur with that or would you have anything to say with that? Or I, I would absolutely um, concur uh, um, with that. Um, in terms of what I posted there, because I'm, I'm not going to pretend like, you know, I, in, in, as, as I just said previously, I initially started from this gut feeling. Yeah. And that gut feeling is a reflective of the natural law. Yeah? Yeah. What, the natural law is simply good over evil, if you like, doing yeah. what's, what's, what's right. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and again, that's why I refer, refer to the, the moral force of law. Um, and, and, and so on. So, uh, no, definitely, I, I I concur with that. There's no 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 um, question about whether you know. Yeah, no, I concur absolutely with that. Bless you, thank you. Now I knew that I was going to say this to you. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this. Mag Listen, you know something. This interview is going to be special. You know what? The first interview I did is special. This interview is special. And the reason is is because. I'm not just asking people to talk just for the sake of it, just to get things up on YouTube. I'm asking important people who've got relevant information. I think that if anybody was to listen to this from the beginning to the end, many different people can gain something, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're male, female, father, non-father, someone involved in this whole freedom business. But the, the main thing is justice. And what I want to tie up it with, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain where I'm at, and then I want you to explain where you're at. Now, I've got this case, as we mentioned, in 2021, December, and I have started promoting it online like it's a club night. I'm sending, mm. I'm sending invites to everybody in the same way. Mm. And you inspired me to do some, you did Empowerment Mondays, and I've, I've mm. been trying to get together Injustice Mondays. Now, Injustice Mondays is not something that are not going to happen. It's going to happen. But now mm. we've got this new lockdown. It's going to be de delayed again. But this thing is going to yeah. happen. So they're the, they're the places where I'm at. And I want you to take as much time as you like or as little time, it doesn't matter, to just explain where you're at, where you're going, especially in terms of the 30th of November. And what do you foresee happening and what is the future for you? Okay, well, that's great. Um, so I, before we get to the 30th of November, just on Monday, this coming Monday, where I'm back in a, um, a magistrate's court again with criminal proceedings, mm -hmm. but 
these proceedings where I'm literally challenging them as to Section 6 uh, of the Human Rights Act and indeed Article 7, no law break, no punishment without law, no, no law. So it's a problem for them. Anyway, our focus, however, is on the 30th because, as I said earlier, after 20 odd years, we've finally um, been able to move from outside the courts to inside the courts. And we have this case, which we are literally taking the British government to court. And um, uh, through the, um, you know, the Secretary of State for Justice and the, the Home Office. Now that's taken on the entire justice system and, and the Home Office. And we are, we, you know, the good, the indication that, or the, the, um, the one thing that indicates a, a, a possible just outcome or a favorable outcome, should I say, is because them, they initially struck our case out, but yeah. that strike out gave us an automatic right to, to, to apply for, to have a hearing. Yeah. And, 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 and having done so, the hearing is going to be conducted by the same person who struck it out. Now, the reason why that's a good indicator is because if it's not favorable, if he maintains that strike out, then that, those proceedings would be unlawful because no man can be a judge in his own cause. He cannot conduct, he cannot sit in, in review of a complaint about himself or herself. So, so that's um, a good sign. And the other good thing is that if he does, if it is unfavorable, then it gives us an automatic right of appeal because, as I said, it would breach Article 6, the right to a fair, independent, impartial tribunal or hearing. Um, so, so, so and, and the other thing is that in these proceedings, the Secretary of State representatives, their lawyers or whoever, will be there. And it will be probably the first opportunity for them to offer to come to the table. And um, so, so whichever way, it's in our favor. Whether if, they, if, he, if, he, if he reconsiders and then put it in court anyway, if he strikes it out, we, we, we will be appealing and it's in court anyway, or they get the opportunity to talk, as I say. Um, so. I, 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 sus, I, sus, I don't expect that we're just going to roll up to the 30th and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Who knows? Maybe they're going to come along and say, due to COVID, that you know things are going to be suspended for this or that. Which it, it may except, very well. And what I want to say as well is that that, that term, striking stuff out, is, is very important. I want to ask you is, because um, I've had stuff struck out, and in fact, I recently tried to get a judicial review and just, on, just over there, down there, they've sent it back to me with certain issues. Um, I tried to take Kafkas to court and also the mother of my children for the alienation of my children to court. And they struck these out. In terms of the Kafkas application, they said it was a collateral attack on the family court. What advice would you give to people because who, who have tried to take certain bodies to court and they get this striking out thing? What advice would you have for that? You know, it's, it is simply, or I shouldn't say it is simply, but what one needs to, there, there's always a point of either pr uh, appeal or, as you just said, judicial review, or just simply asking them to reconsider their decision. Now, um, so, so, so they depend on us not necessarily following through with... It, yes, indeed, and yes. not following through with the procedure. They, when they, when they struck out this case, they kind of put it in small, small print. The claimant is further protected by the the right to apply for this order to be set aside. But in bold print, they put you if you you you've got six weeks in which to amend your statement. Uh, providing you leave out everything about what you say about the judiciary and so on and so forth, you <laughs> can amend your statement and have as much as six weeks to do so. 
and and leave it only to this particular section or or, or 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 whatever. But the main thing is, in terms of the strikeout, depending on how the strike, because if it if the strikeout took place without a hearing, if everyone has the right to be heard, so that strikeout, you could say, gives you that automatic right to apply it for the proceedings to be reconsidered at a hearing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you have the Article 6 is in the determination of their civil rights or obligations and any criminal charges brought against them, everyone has the right to be heard. So you can't just strike someone's application out or, or, or whatever without them having had that I mean, ultimately, without them having had that, that right to be heard. So whether it's, whether it's um, a right by way of judicial review, whether it's a right by way of appeal, whether it's a right, like as, as the proceedings, as the process that I'm following now, it's not an appeal, it's a, an application to set aside the decision, the order to strike out. Yeah. If, as, if, as I say, this now that is now unfavorable especially because it's been it's been dealt with by the same person then we have an automatic right of appeal and of course an appeal would be in court so and and that's where they're they're, they're trying to prevent us going so the next step for us is in court and so court. yeah just just check out what's and and again the other thing to be aware of is that these things come with time limits. So it may be that to set aside maybe seven days or, 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 or 14 days or whatever, but they come with time limits and th those time limits vary from dif um, different um, pursuits and so on and so on and so forth. And those time limits are very much used as a weapon against us a lot of the times, aren't they, those time limits? Yeah, absolutely. But Absolutely. the battlefield yes, is the court. So you're going to battle on Monday, and then on the 30th, you're going into main battle. Um, As I said, I'm going to be trying um, to try be in London on the 30th. Um, when I'm speaking to people at the moment, it's acting like I'm in Nazi Germany because people are talking about crossing borders and stuff like this. I'm, I'm actually trying to go to Scotland on Tuesday. So, But hopefully right. there'll be accommodation in London and I can meet you properly. Yeah. So that would be great. I hope that I don't think of any questions. I'm going to ask you one question. This is the last question. Mm -hmm. This is taken from the, the powerful image that I found, which said, do you have anything you wish to say, Mr. Grant? <laughs> okay. So just bear in mind this. I'm going to give maybe two. Uh, let me give three quotes, if I, if I just to solidify yeah. what we've been talking about and 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 so that you know we don't appear to be like some deluded persons who who've gone off on some fantasy from as far as francis bacon he said and i believe he was some former lord chancellor or something but francis bacon said if we do not maintain justice justice will maintain us yeah so that's like a warning if we do not maintain justice, that's the governors, if you like, those who we elect to govern on our behalf. If we do not maintain justice, justice will maintain us. Then there is, uh, there is let me go, go to someone abroad in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, former U.S. Supreme Court Judge Justice Brandeis. He said, in the government of laws, existence of the government will be imperiled if it fails to observe the laws scrupulously. Government is the omnipresent teacher for good or ill, they teach the whole people by its example. If the government becomes a lawbreaker, it breeds contempt for the law. It invites every man to become a law unto himself. And wow. if that was enough for them, it was Lord Denning, Lord Denning, one of their most revered judges, who said, whoever may be guilty of abuse of power, 
be it the state, the government, employer, trade union, or whoever, the law must provide a speedy remedy. Otherwise, the victims will find a remedy of their own. And finally, my brother, all of these principles, indeed, all of these principles are coming from that Clause 61, which was um, found in uh, the Magna Carta, when they, hold, if you like, those barons held King John to ransom, if you like, and say, you're not above the law. If you wrong us, you've got to compensate us. And that was why Clause 61 said, if we wronged you and fail to remedy it, you're entitled to seize our castles, you're entitled to do whatever you want to do, except harm us. Please don't harm us, but you can seize our castles, you can do whatever you like. Those were the founding principles of uh, Clause 61 of the Magna Carta, which established that no one is above the law. And as I say, it's either uh, 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 the law applies to all or it applies to none at all. Powerful. Oh, oh, I tell you something. I'm going to be delighting in the fact that this interview is up online for people to listen to and watch. And you know something else? I would feel if I was a judge in my case, your case, or any other case, well, our cases, especially your case, I would be terrified of you coming into my court if I was a corrupt judge. So bless you, brother. Thank you for giving me this time. You are exemplary, a massive great example to not only black men, but anybody, everybody. But the reason why I say that is because um, there's a lot of young people now, be they black or white, in certain cultures that are so, we believe that they're empowering themselves through certain things which are basically just leading to their deaths mm. or leading to prison. Mm. I only wish that they could have heard what you just said there of how we can be empowered. So, brother, so much. Bless you and thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I'm absolutely privileged and uh, my gratitude to you. And it's an absolute pleasure for me to be able to, as I say, um, stand in solidarity with yourself. I absolutely respect everything that you're doing and support everything that you're doing. Um, it, it, if, if there were just a few more soldiers like, like yourself prepared to stand up, because that's the only way um, we can you know, um, extract from the system or make the system do what it's supposed to do. Um, because as Frederick Douglass said, here I go again, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And you're making that demand. We're making that demand. And we're demanding that, as I just said, it's either the law applies to all or it applies to none at all. And they, you know, you're quite right. I know that they are, Petro, that's why they put your case off until December 2020. I've not heard of it, my brother, before. Not heard of such, because, because you're supposed to have, the, the part of Article 6 is that you're supposed to have a, a speedy trial. Anyone charged with any criminal offense is supposed to have a speedy trial rather than have it hanging over your head. You know, like having this cloud hanging over you, this cloud of doubt and so on and so forth. So even that length of time is a breach of your human rights, breach of the law. So, so, but that's simply because you're prepared to stand up and be counted. You know, so more power to you. And it's been my absolute um, pleasure. Uh, you know, when, when, when um, I had been, as I said, I had a radio interview early this morning. It went on till about 11.15 or thereabouts. And thereafter, I was just bombarded with um, telephone calls and so on and then last minute I remembered oh no I'm supposed to have a, <laughs> a, a three o'clock and I was even at the time I was thinking I'm gonna um, get up before I remembered that I had the, the three o'clock I, I was gonna get up shower 
and go go for a walk and so on and and then when i remembered now and then i went in the shower came out checked the phone and there was a message from yourself and i thought oh brilliant he remembered um so um forget so, so they knew. Forget brilliant this. fantastic Carl, fantastic thank you so much bless you thank you cheers